Cash Flow Diary Podcast, Episode 88. Congratulations, you showed up. Give yourself a high five in celebration of your success. Welcome to the Cash Flow Diary, where new and experienced investors come to take confident action towards their goals. Your host is a family man, a real estate entrepreneur, investor, coach, and instructor. As a master facilitator of Robert Kiyosaki's Cash Flow 101 game, he's inspired many to begin their journey into creating cash flow for themselves and their family. And now, here he is to offer you the tools required to earn the income desired. Your cash flow coach, Jay Massey. All right, everyone. Welcome one more time to the Cash Flow Diary Podcast. I am your host, Jay Massey. Glad that you have decided today to invest some time with us, and we are looking to produce a massive return uh, because we have a guest that truly needs no introduction today, but I will get to that in just a moment. Here's the thing. Some of you, uh, maybe you're looking at creating cash flow for the first time, or maybe it's the 101st time you're thinking about it. And either way it goes, we've prepared a course for you. Just go over to learninvestingnow.com to help yourself get started so that you can begin your journey. Now, when it comes to cash flow, I, I'd like to say this, this, <laughs> our guest today literally wrote the book about it and has, in fact, has written so many books and many of them being New York Times bestsellers. It's absolutely crazy the amount and wealth of information that we're going to be able to bring to you with this particular episode. Imagine this. Imagine if you had uh, been able to advise, serve two completely different presidents on financial literacy. Well, today's expert has done that. Uh, imagine if you had written a book that has sold millions, and I mean millions upon millions upon millions of copies, and been there and seen this transformation process and has dedicated your life to making sure that not only adults but also teens have the ability to go out there and understand the money concepts that are required for success. Well, I am excited, and I hope you are, to welcome none other than Miss Sharon Lecter. How are you doing? I am doing fantastic, Jay Massey, and I'm so happy to be with you and love what you teach because it is cash flow is king. <laughs> well, I, I have you to thank uh, in so many ways. Uh, I think many of us know that you know you were there with the the, the creation of the definitely the cash flow board game that has been it's a pivotal part of my entire business still to this day. Uh, I've had the privilege of teaching thousands of people. Uh, not only in the U.S., but also internationally as well. And uh, you perfecting that idea and helping that come to the marketplace is, is honestly why I'm even here. Well, you made those choices, though. Let's make sure you take ownership for what you've created. I'm delighted that I had a small part in playing in creating a game and creating the materials at Rich Dad and, and with Napoleon Hill Foundation but I always tell people when they say, you've changed my life, I said, nope, I did some things and I'm really proud of what I created. But you read it, you employed it, and you took action and you took massive action and now you're helping others. So um, I'm really proud of what you've done and the, and the thousands of people that you've impacted as well. Awesome. Thank you very much. Now, I'm excited uh, about your new projects and I want to jump straight to that. But before we do, if just... In case it, there happens to be someone who may not uh, understand a little bit more about, you know, who you are, etc. Here's what I'd like to say. I often say that today's entrepreneurs are like yesterday's superheroes. And if you think of, you know, Wonder Woman or, you know, Batman or, or Superman or any of those superhero characters before they were Wonder Woman, Batman or Superman or all these things, they had alter egos. They were somebody else before then. So what the first question I would love to know is that I would love to know is who was Sharon Lecter before Sharon Lecter was, well, Sharon Lecter? <laughs> well, my name was Sharon Yates before I got married 34 years ago, but um, I was a straight A student, which was not always a good thing because it made me want to be perfect in everything. And when you get out in the world, you realize that uh, nobody's perfect. Mm. But I uh, started my career as a CPA, and it didn't take me very many years to understand that I really was an entrepreneur at heart. And I didn't want to work those many hours for other people. If I was going to work that hard, I wanted to work for myself. So at the ripe old age of 26 is when I left public accounting and started building businesses. And I've had the pleasure and honor of being able to choose businesses that were aligned with my passion, 
for your audience. They can remember talking books, children's books with the sound strips down the side. I met the original inventor of that, and I helped grow that industry, create it and grow it globally. So that was a fun time when my own kids were not um, avid readers. So really was incredibly uh, fulfilling for me to see the the growth of that company and then moved to Arizona 22 years ago. And um, that's when my oldest son went off to college and got into credit card debt. So I was pretty mad at him, but more angry with myself because I thought I had taught him about money. The problem was he was with me when I used my credit cards, not with me when I paid them off each and every month. And when he went to college, he was bombarded with credit card offers. So that was December of 1992. And that's really when I dedicated the rest of my career to financial education, financial literacy, and I'm as passionate about it today as I was then. And I really focus on families, entrepreneurs, young people, and women. And it's just um, you know, a mission that is a never-ending one because at the end of the day, as you, I know, will agree, we are either a slave to our money or a master of it. And when you can master the concept of cash flow, you can become a master of your money. Oh. Well said. And, you know, you you said something else that I, I want to bring out because oftentimes, especially as a new entrepreneur or an entrepreneur at, at, at times, we can focus on, you know, going to get the next holler, higher dollar revenue mount or, or figuring out how to, you know, increase or decrease our contribution margins and make sure that we go in the correct direction to make things work. Now, my my question, though, is because you said something and I thought was awesome. You said you were fortunate to work with businesses that are aligned with your passion. Would you say that that's been, if there's a secret to your extensive success, would that be it? Well, I think I've made those decisions along the way because, um, you know, when I, I started the Rich Dad Company and, and I was partners with Robert for 10 years, and it was when I just made the decision in 2007 that the company was no longer aligned with my personal mission. And it was a tough decision because we were at the height of our success, and yet it was no longer where I felt comfortable with my own passion being in alignment with the company you wanted to go into a franchising model. So I made that tough decision. And so my message to you and to your, your listeners is sometimes we have to close a door in order for others to open. And it all comes back to who you are and how you feel about what you're doing. You may be in a job that does, is not aligned with your passion, but that job is generating the revenue that can help you make that move when the time is right. But it's very important for each and every one of us to know that we, we only have 24 hours a day and that the one resource that we don't get back is our time. And so understand that you are investing your time and building your future. And if you're not feeling comfortable with what you're doing, you may need to close that door and look for another door to open. Well, and OK, so this this brings up the question that I know they're thinking right now is, OK, I hear you. I want to do that. But how do I deal with the, the the fear and the concerns of, well, if I leave what I'm doing right now, A, <laughs> what am I going to do? And B, is it going to work? And C, will it work to the level that I need it to in the time frame that I need it to? How did how did you reconcile all those questions? Well, all of those things are valid questions and valid concerns. And what happens is fear can do one of two things. It can paralyze you or motivate you. And when we talk about Courage. Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is acting in spite of the fear. And so if you're in a position right now where you know you're not comfortable, it's not what you want, have you, do you have a reserve? Have you started investing? And in your case, you know, we're talking about real estate investing. Do you have that first property? Have you learned the nuts and bolts of property investing while you still have that, that uh, safety net of an income? And what you need to do is focus on what your eventual outcome is and then start working towards that. Maybe you can't, you're not in a position to leave your day job and that's okay, but set course on a plan that will give you the ability to start investing on properties, to start building your passive income so that you have a plan that know, you know that in two years or three years, you're going to be able to get enough property to be able to offset that income, and then you can release the job that's no longer in alignment with your passion. Only you can make the decisions on what you're doing with your time, and the choices that you make each and every day will define how close you are to financial freedom. Nice. 
Now, you, the funny thing is, is that hearing you say that, it just felt like the cash flow game all over again. Because that's one of the basic lessons that I take away and that I often teach people to take away from the game is it doesn't really matter where you start as so long as you have that plan. And as you're playing the game, you build and eventually you, you know, but you don't quit your job. You, you, you're still a janitor, a doctor or a lawyer or whatever the job is as you're going out there to make those transitions and those changes. And sometimes that, that path starts with education. It, it starts somewhere, but at least you're on the path. And that's what I know that's what gave me so much hope uh, way back when yeah I started playing the game and before I started teaching the game and all this other stuff. And I I just it's just it's awesome uh, to know that there is a way we just maybe haven't been taught the way. Now, there's something that you you mention and just in general uh, represent and and I think for many many individuals because you you began to hit on it when it comes to fear and making these changes. Uh, I your your new book is you know think and grow rich for women and being a father <laughs> of three daughters. This one is uh, kind of close to my heart. It, it's close because I, I want my my daughters to not feel that they have to be dependent on a, a male counterpart for any sort of their income. I want them to make sure that they understand that they can go out there and create value and all, all of these things. But what I what I want to understand is what was the genesis? Why was this book necessary in your opinion? Well, let me um, dial the clock back a little bit. When I chose to leave the Rich Dad organization, it was I had no clue what was the next step for me. And it was when I closed that door, I got the call from President Bush. I had the opportunity to serve both presidents. That opportunity would not have come to me had I not made the decision to leave. And then I got the call from the Napoleon Hill Foundation, and I've done three books with the foundation. Again, that opportunity was only because I had freed myself of other obligations. So um, my first book was Three Feet from Gold. Then I did Outwitting the Devil, which was a book hidden away for 73 years that Napoleon Hill had written as intended as a sequel. And in that process, most of my career, I've, I've kind of resisted writing a book for women because I felt the steps to success were the same. And I've started seeing the business world really evolve and change. And so a few years ago, I thought, you know, even though the steps to success are the same for men and women, we do approach them very differently because we all have unique strengths. And there is a difference between men and women and how we think and how we operate. A little and bit. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. And so when I was in my conversations with the foundation, they had never given anybody the rights to do that. And they said, Sharon, I, we think it's time and you're the person to do it, which is a huge honor and certainly also an awesome responsibility. And so in the book, I honor Napoleon Hill. I start out each chapter. I follow the same chapter format as the original Think and Grow Rich. But if for, for your listeners who may not be aware of Think and Grow Rich, it was released in 1937 after a lifetime of research of the most successful men of his time because of the only titans of business at that time were men. And Napoleon Hill created this work of brilliance, Think and Grow Rich, because it's not just one man's philosophy. It was the synthesis of success of all the most successful people in the world and many people who considered themselves failures. And that's the power of the book. And Think and Grow Rich is as powerful today as it was when it was released. Mm -hmm. So I want to honor that. And then I wanted to look at those steps to success through the eyes of successful women to try and draw out how women approach these steps, maybe a little differently than men. And I tell you, it, it was such an incredibly fun and engaging and inspirational project because to be able to bring this wealth of information together, looking at these steps of success through successful women, women of history, current women today in the education field, in the political field, in the corporate world, women entrepreneurs, and some young women rising stars. It was such an incredible opportunity to see it and to be able to share how women have embraced these concepts and created not just lives of success, but also lives of significance has been an incredible um, a, incredible journey for me. And I'm just thrilled with how it turned out and thrilled with the response we've had. Now, if it's, I, I'm just curious, you, you've written 20 books. I'm, I'm assuming through that process with each book, you learn something, even still today. I, I, I'm curious to know what, what did you learn going through this process? Because I, I, clearly Napoleon Hill learned a lot going through his process, but what did you learn through your process with this book? 
just an admiration for women who have um, succeeded when they didn't have necessarily a man supporting them. They were maybe a divorce situation with young children and the burning desire that they possess to create foundations of wealth and that never giving up attitude. It really, you know, I, I have had a very, very incredibly blessed life and I've worked very, very hard but I've been blessed with a 34 year old marriage. So, um, it's to see these women, many of them who were against all odds, um, facing poverty, um, facing bankruptcy and had the, the will and the desire to pull themselves up by the bootstraps and not rely on, on welfare, not rely on a man, but to really take hold of being able to build wealth, whether it be through real estate or entrepreneurship or through a network marketing company. And just the sheer passion of these barracudas for their kids and for their families. Um, it's just, it's just inspiring to see it. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it's, it's almost a, a story that w- when your desire or, or will is large enough, the facts don't count really. It's like it doesn't matter your situation so long as you've got the, that burning uh, inside. You're going to go do what, you know, whatever it takes to make happen. So share with us, if you will, probably what you would consider one of the most impactful stories uh, that you uncovered during this process. Oh, my. There's so many, so many. Um, the women that I highlight in the book talk about one of the things that I do share which I thought was wonderful, was Oprah Winfrey um, addressed the graduating class at Harvard. And she shared the fact that even at the height of her success, I mean, she's considered one of the wealthiest women in the world, one of the most successful women in the world. And yet she stood in front of these kids talking about when she started her own network, that she was feeling like a failure because the network didn't take off the way she had anticipated it. And she felt totally adrift. Her confidence was gone. And she shares that at a level that is so um, passionate and so open and revealing to people. And I think that that really has an opportunity for the reader, anybody that understands, you know, you look at her and you think of this incredible success story but to realize even at the height of her success, the woman doesn't have to worry about anything ever again. And yet she was feeling inadequate. She was had that lack of self-confidence. And each and every one of us has that happen to us. And the issue is, do you have the people around you that are going to help build you back up to help you get through those deep moments? Because we all have those moments when we feel like quitting. We all have those times when we say, I'm just not sure I can keep keep on this track. (laughs) And yet to find that motivation and to say, if it happens to the best of us, it gives you the opportunity to feel a little better about the fact that you're, you're normal. (laughs) <laughs> right. <You're normal. laughs> yeah, I know. It's like, well, if if it happens to Oprah, then it must be okay for me then. All right, I'll take it. Yeah, and you just you find that strength to keep to keep going. Um is there any other story that maybe maybe one that didn't make it cuz I I know what I learned in writing the with my my I've gotten through my first one now. It's like, okay. Uh is that I couldn't put everything in there that I wanted to put in there. Is there a story that you were like, man, I really, 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 really want this one in there, but there just isn't enough room? Well, I had a lot of stories that were similar of the the women who found themselves abandoned um, with children and had to pick it up and try and figure out what to do and how to reach out and create um, financial stability for themselves. And I tell you, I had Oh gosh, dozens of those kinds of stories. And of course I couldn't, I needed to have a sampling of all kinds of women. And that's when I tell you that that impacted me to just see this, these women who were just literally destroyed financially and destroyed emotionally. Um, and yet they found that love of their children, that love of taking care of their kids to enough motivation to put a stake in the ground and say, I am going to do whatever it takes to take care of my kids. So yeah, I have lots of those stories that, I, that didn't get it into the book because I had to make sure I had various different types of women. But I will tell you 
the ones that are in the book that share that story are heartwarming and will touch you in ways that are unimaginable because each and every one of us, we feel like we're on, when we're in a down period, we tend to um, withdraw and go dark and think that we're the only ones on earth that are facing a problem. <laughs> and, and it really is up to us to put that hand out you know, and say, help me and find the people that are there to support you and be able to get you to the next level. And we don't want to talk about handouts. We want to talk about hand up, you know, education, getting together with a group like yours, Jay Massey, where you're teaching them the essence of how to build that cash flow and that you don't have to have millions of dollars, that you can start with nothing and you can create it and you can build it. And that's so important because once you find the way to do it successfully once, then you repeat that system over and over again and you see your net worth grow. And that's the same thing these women is when they find that that opportunity that fits right with them and then they see that first step of success, they learn the model and they keep repeating it. Exactly. Now, you, you brought something up that I find interesting and I'm curious to know what were some of the other motivational factors because for... You, you said that uh, a lot of women were, you know, they find the, the desire inside of their family or taking care of their kids, et cetera. But um, what were some of the other things that individuals were able to see and they were able to look at and go, you know what, draw that line in the sand, plant their flag and make it happen anyway? Was it, it surely it wasn't just for their kids. There had to be something else as well that would motivate these women to go on, take on life and make things happen. Well, I think, you know, we've got some great stories in there about persistence and how you persevere. And one is um, the M Michelle Patterson, who took over Maria Shriver's California Women's Conference. And, um, of course, it was a huge success with Maria Shriver because you've got the celebrity, the governor's wife, everything. And um, it went dark for a year, and Michelle Patterson stepped in to reinvigorate it. And the first year was just you know, a real mountain climb and everybody told her to quit. She was a million dollars in debt and she, you know, everybody was telling her, you just need to fold it, you know, stop while you're ahead. And she just absolutely was dedicated to providing this platform for other women and was just absolutely driven to succeed and through all of this criticism, all of the naysayers, she created an, a, a wonderful event. She's now had her second one and has now created a global initiative for women. And it's so important for each and every one of us to understand what is your, your mission? You know, is it for your family? Is it for yourself? Is it for, you know, you know are you out to prove something to yourself? A lot of times we say, well, I want to prove myself to other women or more, more than likely, you want to prove something to yourself and be realistic with yourself and honest. And the, the drive, just like men, we all have our passion. We have what we want to achieve in life. Um, I had a goal. I wanted to be a CPA. I reached that goal. I had another goal. I wanted to change the law in Arizona. I reached that last year. And everything I need to do, when I reach the goal, I take a moment and say, okay, now what's my next goal? What is it that I'm going to be striving for? What am I going to be working towards so that I can feel good? And I also think women particularly need to have what I call little wins. I mean, you may want to lose 50 pounds, but that's a pretty big goal. So start off by wanting to lose five pounds and celebrate when you lose five. And all of a sudden, do five more, and then you're going to be a whole lot closer to 50. Same thing with debt. I say, you know, so many people are mired in debt, and they look at it like it's a never, it's an impossible mission. Well, let's take that first credit card, the one that's got the smallest balance. Let's work towards getting rid of that credit card, getting off, the, getting rid of that debt. And when you do, celebrate and be feeling good about what you accomplished. And that that celebration is going to build your self-confidence and give you the motivation to start tackling that next arena of debt. So whether it's your children, whether it's getting out of debt, whether it's achieving a new goal, whether it's because you want to prove something to your parents or to your friends, um, each and every one of us have motivations that will propel us, decide what it is, what motivation is it that's going to drive you to do whatever it takes to achieve your goal. Indeed. 
And it, it's funny that you mention how sometimes our friends will say things to us that aren't necessarily in alignment with where we're trying to go, specifically when they say, hey, maybe you should quit. Uh, I'm curious, you know, because you've been through so many different things. What do you think motivates those that are close to us to say things like, well, you should probably quit or give up and let let that go and try something else? Okay, guys, if you uh, have ever gotten that question or wondered that about from your friends, families, etc. You're going to really love her answer. And yes, I'm going to get you back to it. Just wanted to give you guys a quick update, let you know that things are still moving forward in terms of the audiobook. We haven't forgotten. I haven't forgotten you. Uh, hopefully you haven't forgotten us. Hopefully you're still listening. Many of you, uh, we are sending out an email. You should have received it uh, in terms of the audiobook, etc. So that's why you have the full and complete update, at least as we have it at this moment. Here's the good news. Um, the good news is it's still happening. We're going to make it happen. As many of you probably have already figured out, sometimes you start doing something and, and new things come up that you're like, oh my goodness, didn't know that that meant that. That's part of the reason that I hope you are inspired to take action anyway, because the day you want to go out there and buy a piece of property and hold it or flip it or whatever, you're going to run into a whole list of new things that you did not know were going to happen. And the good news is, is that you can still get through it. Here's the point. Have a great team behind you and communicate what's going on. That's what we're attempting to do with this particular message right here today. So consider this a public service announcement. And now I'll get you back to share. That's a great question. I'm glad you asked me because that's so important when people, they start internalizing it and feeling like, you know, that that person is mad at you. And I always say, stop and think about you are the one who's moving and changing your life and working towards becoming better. And the people around you are, are, actually feeling fear, fear of change. You're changing, but they're not. And so what happens is they they externalize it by making comments that are belittling to you. But look at them and say, when they say you're crazy to do that, understand that what they're saying is, but I'm jealous because you're doing something and I'm not. So reframe their comments and it will allow you to have a better way of responding to them. And say, I know you're concerned about the outcome, and I really hope that you'll trust that I'm doing this because I need to. And what happens is sometimes it's our own family. So we need to be careful about what our environment is. And if we're not in an environment of people who are supporting us and driving us, then you need to change your environment. Now, sometimes we can't change our families, but we can certainly change the amount of time we are around them. Because what happens is our family gets worried about our success and they start becoming detractors. But as soon as you start having that success, they become your biggest champions and they're right there next to you saying, oh, I know you could do it. I know you could do it. And you have to laugh because they're the ones who were criticizing you at at the beginning. But it's not you they're criticizing. It's that fear, that fear that they have that you're changing and they're not. You you know what's so funny about that is that there are some people when we, my wife and I were first starting, they were saying, Jay, you need to go get a job. You need to go get a job. And I just refused. And they're like, but you don't have, you you don't know where you're going to stay. You don't have any food. How are you going to eat? I'm like, I don't know, but we're going to figure it out. And some of the many of those individuals um, have since either invested with us, bought property from us. They're just like, oh, wow, you know, he's great. And it's so funny, you know, that you say that. And it's also unfortunate that oftentimes those individuals are the ones that are related to us. My wife often says uh, to other people when we're, you know, counseling or working with them in various forms, we will say things like, well, Sometimes if you, if you can't change your people, you need to change your people <laughs> simply because you, you, you need a better supportive environment. And I know without that environment, um, I, I say all the time, environment trumps will and it brings us down into this to this place. And then uh, I was talking with D.C. Cordova and she said something that has stuck with me for a while. She said, you, you've got to make decisions only when you are emotionally sober and you're not emotionally sober when you're surrounded by what you called detractors. Right. And in Three Feet from Gold, we have a quote that says, uh, never make decisions in a valley. So it's really the same thing. When you are 
at a high emotionally charged state. That's the worst time to make a decision. Just like when you've had surgery and you're still on on painkillers, they go, don't sign any contracts. It's the same <laughs> thing, you know, because emotion does the same thing. It gets you to a high state of of excitement and you make state you make decisions that are not based on wisdom. They're right. based on whim. Now, one of the things that uh, I found interesting and in something that you said earlier as well, because this is actually one of the reasons we chose one of our current property managers is because he went out there and and uh, created uh, a space where he was able to actually influence law and obviously in favor for landlords, et cetera. And because he went through that process, that told me he was the right kind of property manager that I wanted to work with to watch over our buildings. You mentioned briefly that you were able to to make a dent in Arizona law. I would love to know a little bit more about that. Oh, so absolutely. Last June, we had a law signed in by our governor that um, it will re- it requires financial education for high school graduation, and it's been literally a twenty plus year mission of mine. Um, There's still a long way to go. We still need to get the school districts in the state of Arizona to employ it. But now we have it codified in the law that students must have financial education before they graduate from high school. So it's a huge win for me personally, but it's going to be a huge win for the students of Arizona once we get it employed. And then we obviously want to take the success and get it into other states in the country. I'm all down for that for sure. Uh, If there's a petition we need to go sign, let us know, because that is exciting. I I think about, you know, just the message of financial literacy, financial education. And I think most of the time, the reason I I know for myself, the reason I made the choices I made is mostly because I didn't know there were other choices that could have been made uh, that that happened. You know, when you talk about how we go out there and earn our income or what we do with money, et cetera, et cetera. And I definitely um, I'm for that in, in any way, shape, form I, I possibly can. Now, inside the I, I'm I'm just curious because I, I'm thinking about my daughters right now. What the who's the the youngest person that's uh, featured inside your book right now? Oh, gosh, that's a great question. Um, I think in their early 20s, I have several young women that are um, in their 20s and 30s that are um, out making differences. I had, I've never been asked that question before, Jay. I've got to think about that. Um, there's a lots, I think it's so important for each and every one of us to understand that we each, from the age of reason, you know, we are each making decisions that propel us forward or not. And that's so important. And we actually are working on another book called Think and Grow Rich for the Next Generation. And that one, I'm probably going to get my not my brain twisted here as to when I think about who's in what book. But in that book, we're highlighting young entrepreneurs. So anyone listening, if you have someone in the in the tween years or teen years and young adult um, that you think is um, has created great wealth or significance, please reach out and let us know. Awesome. I think that's going to happen somewhere. And you're probably going to learn a lot about technology in that book. Now, recently, uh, you and I were both at an, an event and you were on stage and you were talking about a segment. A segment of your presentation had to do with something I thought was uber important that many, many, many more Women, men, et cetera, I think needed to hear. You were talking specifically about how, how women interact with other women in business and how, what, you know, versus how they should be interacting with each other and how that could help, you know, all of them, all of us become better supporters of each other. Could you speak to that a little bit more? Well, I, there are a couple of very important goals in the book, but the, one of the most important ones is to change the dialogue that women have. Instead of criticizing and complaining about each other, we need to start celebrating each other. We need to celebrate the accomplishments that have been made. And in the world of business, you know, the, the business world itself has changed from the industrial age of com- competition and dog-eat-dog dog to one where the business world has become very collaborative and cooperative. 
And in that space, women excel. Women are great collaborators. We're great problem solvers. Men, on the other hand, are great strategic thinkers. And so it's really not women. I'm not a woman's liberal at all. I love men. But I think it's important that we work together and bring the brilliance of men and the brilliance of women together at the table. And it's when women can start approaching men and be, and really highlight those champions out there that are champions for women and change a lot dialogue. So, you know, in my talk, I talked about getting rid of some of our, the negative comments that we make and change them to positive. For instance, we complain about the fact that there are not enough women on corporate boards. And it's a true statement. Absolutely, we need more women on boards. 16.9% of board seats in America are, are, are women. And that's pathetic. We need many more. But instead of complaining and criticizing these men, we now have the stats and the proof positive that boards that have women and men on them outperform male-only boards by 66%. So if you think about men-only boards are going to want to improve their bottom line, that stat, the positive side, is what they should be hearing as opposed to us criticizing them and complaining and so we talk about the, you know, you get more bees with honey than vinegar. It's the same thing. We need to start changing our dialogue and start, instead of criticizing each other. And when I started my career, successful women were horrible to each other. They were not good about helping women behind them. But that's really changing. There are more and more women networking groups. There are more and more women who are providing mentorship and, and leadership to other young women, helping them secure positions of influence. And that's the, it's so important that women start helping each other. Yeah. I, I, it's a concept that I, I often call it cooperative capitalism as opposed to competitive capitalism. And when you were talking, I was just like, that is so right <laughs> in so many ways. Cause uh, I, I don't think it, I personally, I don't think that's uh something that's uh limited to just women. Uh, that's why I wanted you to bring it up again, because uh, I know it's very, very true, especially if, for whatever reason, I, I'm just going to say it's a general mindset that, I, you know, I've got to do it all on my own and try to push other people down and all this other stuff. But being cooperative has helped me tremendously. And most of many of the higher up company advisors that we have are, are female because you guys have a I call it a sixth sense. You You just know something that I miss every time. And Whenever we work together, we we come up with a, a better solution than what any one of us would have come up with on our well on our own. Uh, Absolutely, and it truly is that male male female model working together that gives you the greatest results. I I I, I can only underscore it the most. It's like my uh, people ask me how do you how do I build a team in in so many different states and all this other stuff, and oftentimes I. I I tell the guys that, look, you, you need someone, a female on your team who can help you with this because they, the, the together you two will put together a better team than just you by your, you know, self thinking about, you know, what y you think you know in terms of, you know, either the construction crew or, you know, the management crew or emergency crew or whatever it is that you got to do. And I, I can track so many decisions where, if if it was just me or me in the in the male side of the company versus me and everybody, oh man, there, there's I think the number might even be higher than sixty six percent. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> 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 but, but yeah, I definitely appreciate that. Now, so when it comes to the the concept of think and grow rich for women, what would be the I guess the the thing you hope this book allows uh, or begins the, the the change? What's the ripple effect that you're looking forward to uh, from having created this resource? Well, it's interesting because I think that ripple effect is starting already and it makes me very exciting. Women are really rising to the occasion and excited about the message, as are men who have read the book, because it really gives you insight into women's capabilities and their mindsets by reading the book. So it's it's for men and women. And I think, as I said, talking about changing the dialogue from negativity to positive thought. But more importantly, um, the one chapter in Think and Grow Rich for Women that is separate and not in the original Think and Grow Rich is the very last chapter. And I call it uh, One Big Life because one of the things that women tend to really saddle themselves is this work-life balance crap. Excuse my French, but <laughs> it's, you know, it's women feel horribly guilty 
and they worry a lot because they feel like their life is out of balance. And if you look up the definition of the word balance, it's really being still and not moving. And I don't know a single woman who is ever still unless she's sleeping. And so it's really important for each and every one of us to understand that when we when we start worrying and feeling guilty, we are ruining precious time today over stuff that happened in the past. And so I and I can speak from total experience. I am a champion warrior and I'm the queen of guilt. And it took me about six years ago, I found the definition of the word worry. It's called to pray for what you do not want. Now, let me repeat that. To worry is to pray for what you do not want. And that one definition has helped me improve my life significantly because I still have my what I call worry storms, but it allows me to stop and repeat that definition to myself. And then I can say, okay, I'm not going to concentrate on what I'm afraid of happening. I'm going to instead reframe, repurpose, and concentrate on what I do want to have happen. And just that one mental exercise helps me have a much better positive outlook on life, stop the worry, stop the guilt, and move forward and make decisions based on the positive outcomes I want to see in my life. And so what my goal is that each and every one of us, as women in particular, every morning we have the choice of how we're going to spend our time today. And we don't need to worry about how we spent yesterday. If, if we maybe spent too much time with our business yesterday, today we can spend more time with our kids. But each and every one of us, particularly female entrepreneurs, we have one big life. And the one precious resource we can't get back is our time. And so get in the, out of jump out of bed every morning and say, today I'm going to have one big life. I'm going to have love my family. I'm going to love my work. I'm going to love my church. I'm going to love my friends. I'm going to make the most out of the precious time that I have. And by doing that, you can. it's a great opportunity to involve your children in your business, educate them along the way. What an incredible gift you give your kids by letting them understand your business, understand the choices that you're making are to provide them with a better future. They'll they'll love it. They'll encourage it, and they'll be very proud of you. And so that's one of my biggest goals in life is to get women out of this work life balance guilt trip, and have them embrace the concept of one big life. Nice. Now, let me ask you this: If someone's listening right now who's on the fence, they think they are. They think they have the feeling that I'm an entrepreneur inside and I know that uh, I should be writing more offers, doing real estate, taking that idea that I have in the back of my head to that next step. And, and they're wrestling with maybe even their own identity. Who am I in this world and how dare I even think that I could provide a product or service to people that they would purchase? I'm curious to know what you would say to that person. If they're in the process of feeling unsettled and feeling like they possibly should want to do something like that, more than likely you have an entrepreneurial bug inside of you that's just tr- just aching to get out. But understand that you need to nurture that entrepreneurial bug. You need to give yourself the education. You need to surround yourself with people who will help encourage you. And you definitely don't want to cut off your lifeline if you're, you know, if you are paycheck dependent, don't cast yourself out to sea and say, I'm just going to figure it out <clears throat> on my own. Surround yourself with people that want to help you and start attending classes, start learning, because through learning about real estate, some of that fear starts to go away magically because you start learning the terminology. You start seeing real deals. All of a sudden, things that were sitting there in front of your face start showing up as opportunities that you can uh, that you can grab and employ for your own future. And so it's really important to understand that if you've got that feeling it probably means that you have a yearning and that yearning is wants to get out and wants to succeed. So nurture it just as you grow a child, grow that entrepreneurial spirit and allow yourself to experience it and and unleash it to become successful. 
Excellent. Now, for those of us that want to go out there and, and pick up this new resource that you've created, obviously, uh, I'm sure we can go to Barnes & Noble, we can go to Amazon, but I, I'm guessing that you've got something special or, or, or website somewhere that we could go to to get something, not just the book, but something extra with that. Do you care to share with us where that is? Oh, absolutely. If you go to thinkandgrowrich.forwomen.com, thinkandgrowrichforwomen.com, we'll have links there where you can buy it to Barnes & Noble or Amazon. And then we also have free gifts for people who purchase the book. So please enjoy and um, support us and help us get this word out. Share it with all your girlfriends. I have a, women g- groups all over the country, all over the globe that are getting together to do mastermind groups on the book. Because at the end of each chapter, Jay, I have a section called Ask Yourself. And so when I talk about these um, principles, I talk about it through the eyes of successful women. I talk about each principle and how I've employed it in my life. And then I have what I call the Sisterhood Mastermind, which is a series of quotes from famous women, from history, from all walks of life that relate to that principle. And then the Ask Yourself question is back write to the reader, how have you employed this principle in your life? Let's accelerate that principle. Let's say, what else can you do today to encourage that principle in your life and to be able to speed your way to not just success, but success and significance in your life? Nice. Well, I I personally want to say thank you for investing your time here with us. Uh, and I, I hope you felt that you know you've been able to generate a return because we're going to do our best to make sure that this message goes far and wide because I believe there are so many women, men, people that need to hear what it is that you have to say. Well, you are fabulous, Jay Massey, and one of the things I teach is the power of your association, your network will detect you expand your network, you will expand your net worth. And I am honored and thrilled to have the association with you and your group. And I welcome the opportunity to visit with you at any time. Awesome. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, you know what time it is. It is time for you to move at the speed of instruction. So what does that mean from this episode? It means go over to Think and Grow with Rich for Women.com. Take advantage uh, of the free resources that are there. Read the book, but don't just read the book. You know what I'm going to say next. Do the exercises. They're there. She didn't write them just so that you would read them and think they were great. She's th- they're there so that you and I and everyone who consumes them can go out there and change our lives and become bigger, better, better in so many different ways so that we have the ability to influence others. It's been fun talking to all of you again, and I thank you for listening. And more importantly, I look forward to talking to you all one more time. I'll see you soon. Until next time. Thank you for investing your time with Jay Massey and the Cash Flow Diary. When you have a moment, please visit iTunes and leave a positive comment about the show. And go now to our website, CashflowDiary.com, to take advantage of our free business building course, Cash Flow Foundation. Gain the knowledge, understanding, and skill that will teach you how to never need a job again. Until next time. Until next time. Until next time.